Last fall, I was contacted by the Andrew Yang campaign to see if I would speak at one of his events. Now, I was not part of the Yang gang, but one or more of my talks on the concept of a universal basic income had come to the attention of his campaign, and they wanted to see if they could arrange for me to speak at one of their rallies. I couldn't be in New York last October when they first wanted me. We rescheduled for an event in South Carolina, but before that happened, he had to conclude his bid for the presidency. I was willing, though, to be on his roster of speakers because while, I've, while I would have argued with some of his numbers if I'd ever actually gotten to meet with him, he was still the first presidential candidate to champion the concept of a universal basic income in a serious way. And I was excited about being a part of that. Yang's proposal was that every adult in the United States, regardless of need, would receive a $1,000 check which he called a freedom dividend, literally a dividend for being a citizen in the richest nation of the world, similar to the way that Alaska now pays all of their citizens $2,000 a year from the excesses of what the state earns from oil revenue. If you did not know that Alaska gives $2,000 a year to all of their residents, that might be a commentary on how effective it has been in getting people to move to Alaska. Thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> Though many on the right, and by the right I mean Republicans and Democrats, tried to portray Yang as being a tad crazy, he is in fact a very successful businessman who I would venture to guess knows more about math and economics than any of his critics. He and many other forward-thinking capitalists realize that with the increases in automation, as well as robotic labor-saving devices and technology, that we now already have an excess of labor in the United States, and that is only going to get worse. And so to keep the monopoly game going in the United States economy, we are going to have to enable people to spend money in the market, which could be accomplished with a universal basic income. Yang's plan would have cost about $3 trillion, and he proposed for paying that by cutting out all of the social safety net stuff, uh, subsidized federal housing, uh, food stamp SNAP programs, other costly social welfare programs. That would have saved $300 billion a year, he was counting on about a half a trillion of new income from economic growth, which makes sense. You give a poor person $1,000, and that $1,000 will show up in the economy immediately. And the remainder he intended to gain from increasing taxes on the very wealthy, including himself. Now, while that plan did not sound good to either of our corporately controlled political parties, Yang, in my opinion, was still making a modest proposal. I just didn't think he went far enough. If I were designing the program, I would make the monthly payment about $2,000 a month, but I would stage it down uh, for people that were making between seventy dollars to $100,000 a year. I would get it down to zero for people that made more than that. But I would pay for the rest of that by cutting our military budget by about 50% which you all know I kind of want to do anyway, so regardless of the universal basic income. But I would also cease all corporate subsidies for coal, gas, and oil, which are killing us, and I would cease federal subsidies for crops that are killing us, like corn, potatoes, rice, soy, and wheat, and honestly, I'd have to take a hard look at dairy and beef. All, the, all of these are things that we really ought to do, regardless of whether we were dealing with a, a budget issue or not. Americans need to be eating more green vegetables and fruits. Farms should be smaller. We should uh, use more renewable agriculture. We should stop burning so much gasoline in order to grow the crops that we grow. 
But ladies and gentlemen, the fact that I go on the record repeatedly with these sorts of suggestions is exactly why I will never hold elected office in any state of the United States. So everyone, stop asking. It wouldn't work. Call me crazy if you want to, not to my face, I'm getting tired of that, but, but here are the hard facts. We are in, right now, a spending war between our bloated military and the planet that we live on. Okay, just because you steal my pointer, okay, no, here it is. <laughs> in the United States, we spend 30 times as much on our military as we spend on the environment. China spends um, eight times as much on their military as they spend on the environment. So you see how those ratios are different. I don't like either one of them, but 30 times versus eight times. Now let me ask you this. Which of these two countries do you believe intends to still be existing on the earth at the end of the 21st century? And if you ask yourself seriously, you know the answer is not us. We are not living in a way where we intend to see human life on earth 80 or 90 years from now. The question that we progressives are always asked when we bring up things like a universal basic income or a, a green new deal is how are you going to pay for it? Our current president, complains that our postal system is losing money as if the Air Force, Navy, Army, Marines, or fire departments, police departments, or public schools were currently turning a profit. We have to clear our minds of the existing economic system that has evolved over the past two centuries that has evolved in a way to serve corporations. And our tax system which since the Reagan years of, of uh, 1980 forward has been manipulated to serve specifically the rich. We can afford to give every human being in the country a decent and safe, meaningful life, but we can't do it if we continue to worship at the altar of corporate profits and allowing the wealthy to control all of the assets. If we cannot house, feed, educate, and provide health care for our population, then what exactly are we defending? What are all these trillions of dollars in defense doing for us? As the famous founder of the Catholic worker movement, Dorothy Day, said early in the last century, our problems stem from our acceptance of this filthy, rotten system. We don't have to accept it, but it has always been during our lifetimes, and so we tend to assume that the way that things are is the way it's got to be, and that's just not true. Our current economic system is not more than 150 years old. The world changes economic systems at times. We've simply got to clear our minds of this uh, late 19th century model of economics and employment and began to think in a 21st century way. Now I want to propose a thought experiment for us. Let's suppose that we were all passengers on a ship of random tourists. There were 100 people on board the ship, 94 passengers and six crew members. And alas, the ship is wrecked in a storm on an uninhabited island. But fortunately for us, the island has fresh water, several kinds of tropical fruits, some edible game, and of course, an abundance of fish. So how will these hundred people survive? There are several options, ranging from the Gilligan's Island model to something more like the Lord of the Flies model. Some in a group of a hundred might be inclined to just strike off on their own, build their own shelter, gather their own food, and have nothing to do with the rest of the community. Some might break off into family groups, or Lord of the Fly style, there might be competing tribes that would form and stake out a certain part of the island as their own and, and uh, compete with the other tribes for survival. However, on a random group of 100, 
Some are elderly. Some are children. Some may have handicapping conditions. In a group of 100 people, especially from the Ozarks, one or two of them are going to have mental issues. <laughs> Out of five, maybe. But, <clears throat> but if we work together, if we logically assessed the 100 people's skills and their needs, then we could discover that we could all help each other to survive. We could care for the elderly and the sick, we could educate the children, we could feed everyone, we could house everyone out of the resources of the island. But in our thought experiment, what if the six crew members decided that since it was their ship and their crews and all the tools and stuff taken off the boat belonged to them, that they in fact are in charge? They are now the government of the island, and all of the resources ultimately belong to them. And let's add to that that they have some weapons to enforce their claims. Now the 96, or the 94 rather, work for the six. And you can't hunt or fish or gather firewood or get water or build shelter without their approval, their permission, their virtual taxation in the form of labor or favors or other support. That system is closer to how we live now, right? The 1% in the United States has a legal claim, legally, to 80% of the assets so that the majority of society is enslaved by an economic system that was designed by the 1% for the 1%, and those who decide to break the rules created by the 1% suffer punishment, banishment, imprisonment, and possibly death. And maybe the 94 passengers would play along with it for a while. The other guys have got guns after all. But don't you think they would eventually get to a revolution? I do. The more I watch the news, the more mysterious it becomes to me why we haven't seen violent revolution in our nation. In fact, the burning and looting in some of our cities that has been sparked by police violence against minorities is surely the tip of the spear of a cumulative anger that has been building among the poor for a century. Those who have suffered social insult discrimination, oppression. People marvel that they burn down the stores and houses in their own neighborhood. And, and that kind of burning and looting is condemned by both blacks and whites, Republicans and Democrats. But if you'll notice, only white people are mystified by it. <laughs> you know? Black people understand why it happens. We have a social contract in which you don't steal, you don't rob, you don't destroy. And the social contract is predicated on if you work, you get paid and you get a place to live and you get to go shopping for food and clothing. But when that contract breaks down, white people are shocked by, well, why are they burning down their own neighborhood? Because they can't shop there. They can't afford to go in and buy things. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, looting is, is the, the sign of repressed people who were not able to go in the store and buy a television. And so when the revolution starts and these outbreaks, they go and take what they otherwise cannot buy. White privilege gets on its high horse and condemns the demonstration so loudly, so righteously, that some white kid with an assault rifle and how many news stories have we endured that start with some white kid with an assault rifle? This kid decides that he is being patriotic by coming out to defend the businesses and then shoot some of the demonstrators. And he said that he started shooting to defend himself from people who were running away from him. It's like the police shooting unarmed black men in the back because they were 
feeling threatened. If you are threatened by someone running away from you, it is not the person you're shooting at who has a problem. But then Ann Coulter, let's call her the queen of white privilege, says that this 17-year-old terrorist, murderer, that she would like to have him as her bodyguard. And then she corrected herself and said she would like to have him as her president. If I may make an aside here, news and talk show hosts, please let this woman's career die right here. Think back. When has she ever said anything that made sense or contributed to the social dialogue? Can't you see that she is just dangerously crazy? I hereby resolve never to mention her again as long as I live. And I hope that Bill Maher and other talk show hosts and news sources will make the same pledge. She does not deserve a public forum. But back to our island thought experiment. If there were only 100 people on the island, the cruelty of our current economic system would become obvious. We would not rush out to build two houses for five people and leave five other families homeless. We would not fail to share our food with the elderly, the ill, the handicapped, just because they had a pre-existing condition. Our moral judgment would kick in in that kind of context where it's obvious, where you see it and you know it. On a small scale, if we lived on that island of my imagining, we would see that there's enough resources for everyone and it doesn't make any sense to hoard resources for a few and leave others outside. We could see that if we pooled our labor, we really could create a decent society. But let's say after a few years we're rescued and brought back to civilization, <laughs> to call it that. After you'd spent four or five years in an egalitarian society, would you just go right back to stepping over the homeless on the sidewalks? Would you continue to advocate for a healthcare delivery system where you've got good insurance only because millions of other people have no insurance at all? I've mentioned this before, even recently, but in the mid-18th century, when European settlers lived side by side with Native American communities, Ben Franklin observed, when an Indian child has been brought up among us, taught our language, habituated to our customs, yet he goes to see his relatives to make one Indian ramble with them, there is no persuading them to ever return. Now, folks, the European colonists were more wealthy, they were more technologically advanced, they were more secure against winter in many ways. And yet, while it was not uncommon for a white settler to vote with her or his feet and just go live with the Indians, it virtually never worked the other way. Because among the Indians, going to work never meant leaving your children behind being apart from them most of the day, day after day. Growing food, hunting, fishing, building did not mean that some became wealthy while others remained poor. It was only superior weapon technology that eventually gave European invaders control of the continent. But superior weapon technology does not mean that you have a superior culture. It doesn't mean that your economic system is better. This weekend's Labor Day observance was created as a very poor substitute for the International Workers' Day, which is observed around the world on May 1st. International Workers' Day is about workers' rights. Labor Day is about giving labor a round of applause. Our nation's leaders did not want our laborers to get any ideas about having a right to organize, to demand safer working conditions, a living wage, and certainly not a share in the profits. And so we don't have May Day in the United States, but we have Labor Day to make laborers feel appreciated. 
The famous attorney, Clarence Darrow, was approached by a client after winning a difficult case, and she asked him, how can I ever show my appreciation, Mr. Darrow? And Darrow replied, ever since the Phoenicians invented money, there has only been one real answer to that question. On this Labor Day weekend, I do sincerely applaud our healthcare workers, our firefighters, our essential workers of all sorts, from pizza delivery pr people to the people that are stocking the shelves in grocery stores. But I want to give you more than applause. I want you to have a bigger piece of the pie in a more just, safer, and more environmentally secure future. So organize, my friends. Oppressors will never grant you a bigger piece of the pie until you demand it. There is a fake Confucian proverb, really was written by Jules Renard, but it says, he who waits for roast duck to fly into his mouth waits a long time. Don't wait for the wealthy to spring a conscience. It won't happen. Join the tribe, organize, and accept nothing less than justice. The status quo is a stinking, rotten system. And the choice for us now is either justice or revolution. And I'll be happy with either one. I'm just not going to be happy about the status quo. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.